Welcome, everyone. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. It doesn't have the same ring as Happy Friday, but you know you're on the back half of the week, at least when you see us now, right? Until, yes. uh, yeah, until we get back to Friday someday, hopefully, or maybe we'll stay here. If you have an opinion about it, when it's easiest for you, let us know. So how are you today, Commissioner? I am always good if I'm sitting here talking to you, Lee. It does make me feel so much better. I will tell you, if you haven't talked to me in person about this, because I know if you have, I've said it then. I'm going to say it right now on Facebook Live, how much I love my staff. Lee Perry as my senior aide, my, I say chief of staff, communications director, <laughs> HR coordinator, and then of course Hannah who does all the policy work and they both actually oversee interns and there's so much, there's so many layers. So thank you, thank you. I'm her chocolate eater. She likes to bring in chocolate and then, you know, it becomes a burden on her. So the, she gives it to there us. There is possibly an office <laughs> sugar addiction and we'll have to address that at some point down the I road. I help her out. <laughs> um, well, thank you all so much for liking and following Commissioner Wilson's page. Um, so I'm Lee Perry. If you email the district one at ocfl.net email, I reply back. If you want to comment in the comment box for whatever topic you hear that you might have questions, Commissioner Wilson can answer yeah. them live. Open book here. Open book. We want to make sure that we are hearing you and answering. And a lot of times if you have a question, we won't have the answer right away, but it gives us a place to start looking. And that's really our job. So thank you so much for tuning in. Yeah. And I love transparency in government. That's it's it. It's like really nice. That's it. It's, it's, a, it's an absolute must. Yes. So um, let's go ahead and just start talking COVID updates. Yeah, um, so it, it, the numbers are, are, are rolling positivity, which of course is the number of test results that we see through the county testing sites that are positive. Um, those numbers are starting to come back down. And this is sort of what they predicted with the Delta variant, which was that there would be a spike. And the more virulent a virus is, mm -hmm. right, the more powerful it is, the quicker it will do that. Yeah. Um, so because it, the exposure, um, it doesn't take as much viral shed. So the overwhelming majority, of course, right now of hospitalizations um, are people who are not vaccinated. Yeah. We do get updates <laughs> from the major medical providers in the area. And I consistently ask, are we seeing breakthrough cases? And the answer is there have been breakthrough cases, but the difference is those people don't end up on life support. So we, you know, we're still staying the course. We want to try to keep people safe. It's, I'm not a medical professional, but I'm married to one. I'm the daughter of one. Um, I have two siblings that are first responders, actually firefighter paramedics. So um, I know that there's been some conversations this week about what was um, really to me a fundamental um, requirement from our first responders, which is to make sure that when they go out that they're keeping whoever they're attending to safe from a potentially deadly illness. And I don't think that there's ever um, gonna be a place or time that understanding that you may be sick and going into somebody else's space is okay. And I, I know that the conversation is very heated and I know that there's been a lot of attention about personal choice when it comes to vaccine. And I just wanna say, I, I have no problem with somebody exercising their personal choice about the vaccine. I, I would never ever think about forcing someone to be vaccinated, but there is a big difference between a forced vaccination and a condition of employment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in for conditions of employment, everybody that's had a job has had to have some of these things, right? So for instance, when we hire bus drivers, they have mm -hmm. to pass um, a vision test or wear corrective lenses. When we, um, when we have people who are required to do certain types of, of work that need a license, we require that license. None of those requirements are an infringement upon their, their personal rights. Mm -hmm. What those are are conditions of employment. And, you know, the reality of our first responders, our, our law, office, law enforcement officers, our firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, mm -hmm. is that they're going onto a scene where the people on that scene don't have choices. They called 911 and they're, in, they're having the worst day of their life. And I am always so grateful to our first responders for taking on the risk and the, and the, the task of being the first person there to save a life. That being said, that person who is who's has no choices and has called 911 
is really um, in a position of vulnerability. They are without a doubt going to be close contact with somebody that day. And the bare minimum as a government entity we can do is make sure that a, uh, a deadly virus isn't passed on that scene. So that was sort of the, the bottom line position I had. I, I think that the um, update that we got from Head Start mm -hmm. during the BCC mm -hmm. made it even more clear to me. The problem right now I see in the people who don't have the choice to be vaccinated and the people who do, because our children still don't have that choice. Yeah. Hopefully it's coming soon. I mean, we did hear that there's it's moving along for children between 5 and 12, but yes. still not there yet. And the studies are very um, promising. We actually have a, a group here in Central Florida of children whose families participated in some of the trials, which means that there's been successfully treated children in the area. But I'm sure if, if you've looked at the people who are in the hospital right now, there is a population that are younger than we thought originally could be mm -hmm. affected. And, and we actually a baby died recently yeah. and an infant um, died because they don't have the opportunity to protect themselves. And I find it discouraging to hear, well, the vaccine doesn't you know, prevent you from getting COVID. So, you know, what's the point? Well, it's like saying that a seatbelt doesn't prevent a car accident. So what's the point? Well, mm -hmm. if we have some overwhelming statistical data that we're decreasing the chances of a deadly event, yeah, then that's where we that's where we put our stock. That's where we rely we rely on that for public safety. So, yeah. you know, big picture items I want people to understand. It's not about a restriction of personal freedom because ultimately you do get to decide what goes in your body. Mm -hmm. But with employment, and this is private employment, this is public employment, come conditions of employment. And so in the realm of public health, those are very specific. And, and then it's not new. We've always required um, up-to-date vaccinations for our, our school children. Seventh graders have to go in with a new, um, their up-to-date shots. They go into kindergarten with their up-to-date shots. Mm -hmm. My college student had to get her hepatitis update before leaving. So this isn't new. It somehow got politicized and that's tragic. But I just want people who are listening to me right now to understand that I really do fundamentally believe in your personal freedoms. But I also think that we have to make sure that when you have the potential for hurting someone else, that we're talking about their rights. Yep. And that those things don't happen unless you live in your bubble. Yep. Um, just one positive uh, statistic that we received. Now, mind you, there is going to be a coronavirus briefing right at 4.30 today. So sorry that there's a conflict, but we'll be sharing the stream of that. Um, as of right now, there's a 9.31% 14-day rolling positivity rate, which we've seen that go drastically down yeah. from every week. It was at 20% at that same time when that baby had passed of yeah. COVID. It was very high. We were very worried. And now it's been going down and, and we're, we're excited to see it go down, but you still need to do those precautions. Right. And, and honestly, so statistically, correlation doesn't mean causation, yeah. right? So you can correlate two things, but it doesn't mean that one causes the other. And that's a basic statistical principle. But there is definitely a correlation between what we saw as the increased use of mask um, requirements by employers and mm -hmm. the uptick in vaccines. So when that Delta variant mm -hmm. really started affecting people and we were getting funeral notices daily here, mm -hmm. um, we also in conjunction with that saw the uptick of people who I think may have just been hesitant. And at this point, how many millions of people who have been vaccinated safely, I understand there are breakthrough cases, but those aren't the people who are on life support and that's been confirmed again and again. And I just wanna say that the in the meantime, if there's a question at all about whether the decision is convenience, your personal convenience versus someone else's potential life, that, you know, I'm willing to give up my convenience and I'm, I'm willing to take a chance even on a side effect. I'm, I'm willing to take a chance on a breakthrough case because statistically we know for sure that the numbers of people who are dying are not vaccinated. Yeah. I still think we need to do shots for shots, but that's shots me. for shots. Bottles love, of wine I, for I shots. <laughs>
<laughs> awesome. Okay, well, you also had the uh, BCC meeting this past Tuesday. And if you're new here, that is, uh, we have a lot of acronyms in the county, but that's Board of County mm -hmm. Commissioners meeting. And we will try to make sure that if those pop up, that we break it down. The Board of County Commissioners meetings are usually every two weeks, and that's a full day of um, legislation and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. business. It's county business from top to bottom. Yes. So we usually do a big deep dive, which we're going to get to. There's just a couple little updates that we want to share before we get to a deep dive on the BCC meeting and what's to come. So um, Avalon and McKinnon Groves, uh, if you wanted to yeah, talk about that. Yeah, there's an update that. there, and I know my Avalon Rural Settlement people, I love you all. There has been a crazy roller coaster ride um, in that area trying to predict what's going to be coming across the county line, and there was an opportunity for... For us to address the Lake County Commission before their vote. They did um, hold the vote until this week and from what I understand there was a, a some adjustments to the ultimate approval but there was an approval and I, I just want to say that um, I want to thank you all for staying engaged with me, staying engaged with that process. I want to thank the Lake County Commissioners for um, really allowing me a place to share my the concerns of my residents, concerns of the residents in the Avalon Rural District. And I wanna also really uh, reaffirm my commitment to protecting those rural boundaries. The problem that we are seeing right now as far as what happens from county to county and the consistency is a statewide problem because there isn't an over, overall comprehensive plan um, view that the state used to have. and so. Understanding that we had a um, an opportunity to explain that in order for this to be consistent and in order for the people in that area to have good infrastructure and emergency services, that we needed to really look at the way we added density. Um, and I think that the the outcome ultimately was, ultimately was disappointing. Lake County Board, um, the majority did vote to approve some form of that plan. And so we just at this point will say really super engaged to make sure that the Orange County residents that are out there don't feel the impacts in any way that we can, including making sure that the, the promises about where those cut throughs would happen and um, the Lake County's side for emergency services, that those promises are upheld. And I also want to say that there's, um, you know, really no chance of the rural settlements designation changing here in Orange County. There is an upcoming community meeting about a lot split uh, language within yeah. the comprehensive plan. But what that is for is very specifically a handful of lots that a resident or maybe more than one resident came to the county about wanting to make sure that they could try to split those into a five acre and five acre because the five acre is the smallest it was going to be. And they had something around nine acres or nine acres and change. They weren't exactly at the 10 acre. So this was a very specific concern that a resident brought to the county and that county staff then came up with a plan for looking at a way to see if they could split those without every that happened going in front of um, each development board. So we're going to bring it to the community and explain it a little more in detail and look at the map at where those are, the, the lots that aren't quite at 10 acres. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that the residents don't want, we will we will listen to that and make sure that, that we're not changing things that offer protections but this wasn't a uh, applicant um, proposed change this actually came from a, a landowner out there that wanted to do it for personal reasons so we'll continue to make sure we update you but that is on the calendar for mm -hmm. october 7th there'll be a virtual meeting and october 14th it'll be in person so, at the um, korean presbyterian church so mark your calendars and um, if you can't make it to those or, or you have some you know, questions or anything ahead of time, just email us and we will make sure to get you the answers. I actually asked immediately for a meeting with planning because I was very concerned and I've been on high alert for not just the Avalon Rural Settlement, but all of our rural settlements. So mm -hmm. I will continue to, you know, we, we, we are very vigilant about the rural settlement. So we'll stay on that. Yeah. Um, and last night you actually went to a community meeting for the Selnick development. Yeah, I want to thank everybody that came out last night, actually, in the Summerport area of uh, Horizon West. Mm -hmm. I, uh, first of all, I was 
really great. I took a quick loop around to see how things were, and it's such a beautiful area. I love, I love all the Halloween decorations Yay. and the, you know, we go to development um, reviews and and talk to applicants about the things that residents want. Going and seeing them in practice is really amazing, and and so there are the oversized sidewalks there that are used for biking, and and I saw kids, you know playing out on their park fields. Mm -hmm. And so it was really great to go through that area. The reason we had the meeting last night out there in Summerport was the piece of property, the only really existing large piece of property on um, the Summerport side and right across the street from Windermere High School, there's an application in process right now for townhomes. The applicant first applied actually for a zoning change for apartments. Um, very early on in my tenure, I had the opportunity to meet with the applicant and expressed what I had heard from residents, which was that that density did not match what was in existence there, which is, you know, one unit per acre on one side and then on the other side, a detached single family. And so what I asked for was for them to come to the community. It's taken since then and it was months and months for them to actually get a plan together to bring to the community and they did decrease that density and now they're looking for townhomes and that even came down to a, a, a smaller number of townhomes mm -hmm. and the applicant was very open last night to talking about some additional amenities for residents so that there wouldn't be obstruction of view of Lake Kaywood so that the residents of Lake Kaywood wouldn't have um, some kind of mismatch looking out their, their back so there was, um, some, I felt like a very productive meeting and I really want to thank the residents because this area, they come with a whole, you know, education, a master's level uh, education in development plans because they, they live in an area that developed so fast and had very specific development requirements. And so they, they're they savvy enough to have come to this meeting saying, well, are you going to stick with the standards that Horizon West imposed and stick with the plan, which was you know, the, the, the village centers would have a higher density and then, you know, it would go out from there. Well, the future land use map actually designated this particular portion townhome. And, but the underlying zoning is rural country estate. So once again, we have this mismatch of our future land use map and our zoning. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I was so kind of, of our planning people to help explain you know, why those are so, in, they're so completely opposed. Why would mm -hmm. one be this and one be the other? And, you know, in the end of the day, some of it really doesn't make sense to us right here and now because those decisions were made, I think, in I, this one in particular was in 1997, mm -hmm. this designation, mm -hmm. this future land use map. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with the applicant and I'm grateful that they're listening to the residents and hopefully we'll come up with something that really is a benefit to the community and that everyone can be happy with. Yeah, so the, there were two meetings with Selnick. One was virtual and one was in person. The virtual meeting is still on Facebook, so you can watch that anytime. And um, please email district1 at ocfl.net if you have any questions. And next steps, just really quickly on this, is that the applicant, the planning, actually Jason and planning said that we're going to come back to the community again with a uh, PSP, which is a preliminary subdivision plan, because there were so many questions about the way that that would be laid out. And I think in order to really be able to assure residents that it would be compatible, that to bring that the actual plan, the way it would be laid out in that property, including hopefully protecting you know every bit of the waterfront, including protecting, they have a really big, huge tree right in the middle of the property. And there was some really great um, ideas for how to make sure that those things were protected and, and made part of an asset to the community. Beautiful. I love that. We love our trees here. Um, and last but not least, before we move on to the BCC, redistricting. Redistricting is ongoing. This is where the county lines for commissioners are adjusted. We've had population growth over the last 10 years. This only happens once every 10 years when we get census results. And because the county commission has election, election cycles every two years. Now, I'm, I'm not back up in 2022, I go to 2024, but they all of the even number commissioners and the mayor have an upcoming election. So everyone is watching this very closely. There will be big adjustments because there's a certain deviation away from like a, an average that we're allowed to be as a commission. They, don't, they can't, 
they're not going to ever match perfectly, right? You're not going to have exactly the same number of people, but you've got to be within a range. And District 1, my district, is your district, if you're District 1, number is, one. is 12 standard deviations above. And, Which um, is the largest by far. By far. So we are going to be really um, looking at, there's going to be adjustments. The best news of this is that you can participate. And if you're somebody who has an interest in looking at the way that these lines are going to be drawn, please go on to Orange County. Uh, you can just Google uh, Orange County redistricting, yeah. Orange County, Florida. So, mm -hmm. and I think it's OCFL redistricting. And they have an interactive redistricting map dashboard that is amazing. You can get on and take a look at population growth changes and, and differences in demographics and understand that all of these things come framed within the constitutional requirements that we have when we go to redistrict. And in America, we are you know, one person, one vote, and making sure that we don't divide communities, not historical or um, uh, cultural communities, or dilute a particular community's vote. So those things all have to come into play whenever they look at the ultimate like finished product at the end of this. Mm -hmm. So please participate in this with us. My, the two appointees for District 1, I want to thank them so much for their time. This is a very time intensive position. And I just want to thank them for the professionalism and their, their, you know, their ability to really jump in and do this. So um, stay plugged in. We'll be talking about it probably every week until we get to the final maps. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, and just so you all know, October 7th at 630 is when the redistricting meeting is going to take place. Um, October 25th at the West Orange Recreation Center for District 1 is when the in the community meetings yes, are going to take place. Because at least one of them will take place in each district. The um, sort of home base ones. We're going to be here in mm -hmm. the administration building, but because of COVID precautions and wanting to make sure that that if people came, they could get into the building and we don't have enough capacity, yep. they are actually going to be at Barnett Park. So what they're doing is they're having the general meetings at Barnett Park, and then there's going to be one in each district. And um, so District 1's, it will be at the Magic Center and um, out there in Winter Garden area, and we will make sure to get all those details as we get closer. Perfect. Awesome. So let's talk about the BCC and some consent agenda items. Uh, one that you talked about on September 2nd, which finally came to the board, was the um, speed limit off of Winter Garden, Vine Lynn, and Chase Road area. Yeah, woo, who knew this would be controversial? I, I will tell you that one of the things that I don't know if, um, if I had the, like, the bigger picture about when I came into office was how rapidly mm -hmm. our roads changed as development increased in the mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. I think the you know first day that I was notified as a district commissioner about a traffic fatality on that stretch of road, I you know my my stomach dropped. Mm -hmm. I I thought this how does this happen? What do we do? I literally can't think of anything more important than keeping residents safe and the conversation has come up about Winter Garden Island and many other roads that have been in areas of corridors of growth mm -hmm. and the way that those things change the way that those updates happen are that traffic engineering here at the at the county after getting feedback from not just the district commissioner and residents but also from law enforcement and from other experts in their fields do a traffic study and they actually look at what's happening on that road how many cars what the how many accidents where those accidents are and they can really break down where some of the biggest risks are how many places traffic is coming into that road and of course the stretch on winter garden Vineland road there's an elementary school there's you know several apartment complexes and right across the street from those are the amenities they need you know so we've got an apartment complex over here and, and a grocery store across the street and cars that are going so fast that if the light goes through a cycle, someone may not have gotten across. And so when we looked at some of the very tragic accidents, and by the way, Orange County is number one in pedestrian deaths in the entire country. Um, everything is framed by safety and whether or not we can do anything to keep people safe. And I know I've heard from so many of my friends and neighbors that, that this stretch of road was always fast because it was the way you got from Winter Garden to Disney, and I do understand the frustration, but that should have 
really um, been considered, I think, when the residential component came to be. Because why here in our development we allowed an elementary school to be built on one side of, of that rapid thoroughfare and then the neighborhood that serves that elementary school on the other side, mm -hmm. it makes no sense. But that was before my time. All I can do now is say, okay, if we can, you know, make this area in front of an elementary school not look like I-4 yeah. and save a life, we're going to have to do that. And I don't, I don't want you to think that that was a singular decision made by me. I am one vote and I'm only one person. And typically anything that we decide here is because constituents have come forward, residents have come forward. In this case, you know, it included the sheriff's department, the school board. I, there was so much involvement because because there were so many really tragic, tragic scenes on that stretch of road. We get this area, we get so many constituents that are begging and sending photos and asking, where's the traffic study? Where's the traffic study? Because they're afraid their children and their families are at risk, you know, and I don't think now, mind you, slowing down the speed limit is not the only step that needs to take no, place here. No, it's not. And I, and I will say that we need to design for safety, right? So going forward, yes, everything that we do in the design process, including that Selnick um, mm -hmm. plan, right? Because here we are talking about Winter Garden Violin. We're talking about putting an additional 140 families on there, which probably will have children going to schools nearby there. So all those things are connected. And I know that there's frustration with that process. And I, I, I agree with you. I think if I could hit the rewind button, we would make sure that wherever the neighborhoods are, the schools are in them. And that's how Horizon West was intended to, to be, that's how they, it was developed. And actually, the, the elementary school we were at last night was put in that way. It's right nestled in. And so there are no large arterial roads there. But we can't, we can't hit the rewind button on the way that Winter Garden Violin and those apartments being separated from the amenities are design, but what we can do is try to make sure that if somebody needs to cross that road, that they're not going to get killed. And mm -hmm. if somebody is, um, you know, and, and, and here's the speed limit thing. And I think this is, it just, once again, I go back to statistics, your odds of living through a crash at 55 miles per hour change dramatically if you go up to 65 and dramatically if you go down to 45. And so what we want to do is just try to make sure that within that range that we're keeping people the safest we can. So if it's in a residential area, if it's going by schools, it probably, you know, it needs to be slower than mm -hmm. than a highway. And I have to say, I really feel for the people who were kind of at first a little weary of that change because so many people because we don't have transit Our far friend, out past that urban area they're freaking out because they know that lowering the speed limit on a main commuter road means longer yeah. times in your car and no one wants to be no. uh, basically trapped not, yeah. in your car for an hour plus to get to work no that's not the intent and and of course we were not trying to go out you, you know there were some comments about like oh you know can't we just put more sheriffs out there? Can't we, you know? And we have talked to them. They, they, they yeah. are engaged at every step of this process because of that, because there's, you have to have both sides. We have to have to design that mm -hmm. is safe for the community and then the enforcement part of it. Cause you, you know, changing laws alone doesn't do anything and having laws alone mm -hmm. oftentimes doesn't do anything without the enforcement part. So they are very much a part of the conversation, but they also have a whole county yeah. that they're operating to, to keep safe. And so, mm -hmm understanding that those resources are limited, we do need to make sure that if we can keep things safe in a certain zone, so it wasn't all of Winter Garden Violin, but it was the area that was very specifically identified in the study because, um, you know, they, they did, they looked at each kind of transect of that and then what was coming mm -hmm. down the pipeline and development and trying to decide where the, the, the best impact as far as how to keep people safe would be by decreasing the speed. Mm -hmm. So we were actually really optimistic about it because like I said, as a public servant, to hear that there was a fatality on a road is devastating. And you know, those fatalities, that's not just a number, that's someone's brother, mother, sister. And I, I think that if we have to be inconvenienced and I'm one of those people um, that lives there and have, will be inconvenienced that I'm willing to do that so that there isn't another one of those. Yeah. And it wasn't a child, but you know, can you imagine if it was, if that had happened, if that was a child trying to get to school right there. And the likeliness, especially with more development coming in, it's it's going to go up 
And, you know, you, like, you said it perfectly. Every time that you increase the speed limit, every single mile per hour that goes up changes the outcome. Changes the outcome of survival race if there is an accident. Exactly. So, you know, just doing the right thing. And I, I feel for the people that are like, that's more for me. Let's try to get some transit. You know, yeah, let's, let's try exactly. to help these roads become more accessible for people to get cars off the road because adding lanes and does especially not help. I think for so my friends in in district one that come down that stretch or a, you know a lot of the Disney cast members mm -hmm. and they've been doing that for years that's been that is the way to get into the back part of Disney and I think you know what a amazing partnership it would be for that area to get to some some transit with Disney and have some way for workforce transportation where you wouldn't have to worry about taking your car and filling it with gas and, and, you know, not dealing with the traffic. So that's really my, my long vision. My long thought about this mm -hmm. area is to try to have some alternatives. And it's the other reason why we talk about bike paths and bike safe bike lanes. So if there's an opportunity for kids not to go in a car or a school bus, mm -hmm. getting those off the road so that they can ride their bikes to school and, or walk to school and that's healthier for everybody and it, and it decreases the traffic. So all of those alternatives in my head, are transportation alternatives. And so when we have meetings here with transportation, you know, our engineers and with the people in um, planning, I try really hard to make sure that they're not just talking about lanes and roadways because yep. it's not the only mode of transportation. And it certainly isn't everyone's preferred. I would much rather read my newspaper and have a cup of coffee on my way to work in the morning on a train. But, um, you know, that is gonna be the long game in the short term you know, requiring developers to make sure that they're putting in the wider sidewalks and making sure that they that sidewalks connect. We have complete streets mm -hmm. is is the short term uh, work that we're doing. Perfect. Well said. Um, OK, so some other items that came up, energy efficiency proclamation, which is really great. Yes, we did. Um, it was a uh, energy star, which, of course, is a, a, a rating system for energy efficiency of you know many things, but in this case, buildings. Um, was awarding, I believe, our, our um, administrative services department. And if you all remember back to our budget hearing days, I was ready to stand up and cheer because our administrative services department seemed to be meeting every one of the sustainability goals, if not the end product, in the process. And I was just so amazed to see something that we had just voted on in um, our, our sustainability goals really being embraced early. Well, this was an award given by an outside entity um, to acknowledge that work. So what a great thing. And I know Jeff Benavidez and his, his team really have been working so hard to make sure that our operations as a county are getting to net zero carbon. And so, you know, this proclamation was not just talking about our operations, but also about our plans and what we are working on. And so it was very aspirational. And I, I like I like seeing everyone go on the record and sign their name to something like that, because then we have something to hold them to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we also had another proclamation declaring the Head Start Month. I love Head Start. Have you ever heard of Head Start? I love Head Start. It's great. You should look it up. So the thing that you talk about data driven and, um, you know, evidenced outcomes. And one of the things that educators know very well and have known for some time is the earlier that we involve children in the education process, the better the outcomes. And we also know that we don't educate children without considering their whole family and their, their environment. And so Head Start really is that type of pre-preschool pre program that incorporates an entire family and provides, you know, a lot of times the place for speech therapy and occupational therapy and physical therapy, and there's a link to other family services from there and parents come and volunteer in the classroom. And so when COVID hit, it just, you talk about things out there in mm -hmm. our world that I, I feel like are such a, a valuable, valuable treasure for us. Head Start was one of those. And the update yesterday was so amazing to see how quickly they had to adjust in trying to make sure that they weren't losing track of their students and that they were retaining and and trying to make sure that they weren't losing the community because and this was the part that got me emotional was to hear about parents that withdrew their children from head start because even though they knew that the teachers were likely vaccinated and they were all masking that they they were so worried about the safety of their child and and 
you know, there was there's so many challenges there, but trust is is one of them. And, yeah. and you know, anyone who's had a preschooler in their life, a baby, they wrap their arms around you and kiss you on the cheek. Yep. And to be in a time where everyone's asking everyone else to be six feet apart, what a challenge. And, and teachers who go into teaching in that age, at that Head Start age, that is a calling. And to tell them to stay six feet away or to try to do this on a screen, it is challenges that are almost impossible to imagine. And they've done it. They, they got through this. And I mean that in the way that they're, I mean, they still have so many challenges, but they still were able to see these outcomes. They were able to see where their families are and how to engage them. And so we are just really grateful to have the Head Start program as robust as it is here. The director of our Head Start program was a Head Start kid. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you know, it was, it was a good, a good update. Yes, amazing. Um, we also had the Green Place 24 Acres and the advisory board that came up on the consent agenda. Yes, so well. this has been another topic that we've talked about here a few times because it was a goal right coming in this office. We were like, you know, Green Place funding, it, Green Place is the, um, it's an established program in Orange County to acquire environmentally sensitive lands and to hold on to those for future generations. They're set aside in conservation. And historically, there was a certain amount of money that the county invested and the county could take donations. So there would be, you know, a lot of times it's a, um, a family that isn't using a certain piece of property and they understand the ecological value. And instead of selling it off to a developer or seeing some other use, come to the county um, with the donation. Well, donations only get you so far. We understand property values are going up and up in those environmentally sensitive lands. Once they're gone, they're gone. So this year, the county commission, um, the mayor, we all voted on a re-upping of the Green Place, including funding that would be substantial, a substantial investment. So on this particular agenda, we 24 acres right along the Econ River, which is something that is always going to be an environmentally sensitive area. So I think that was a real find, a real gem. And then the, going forward, the Green Place project, the Green Place program will be largely driven by a group of citizens who have an interest in this that will be appointed through our MMRB board. And that is, here we go with the acronyms, the Membership Mission and Review Board. And so if you are interested in that board or any other board, and I know if you all were here a couple weeks ago, we had um, Eric here, Eric Kidwell here, thank you Eric if you're tuned in, talking about his role as an appointee on the Sheriff Citizens Review Board. That is a direct appointment and there's a handful of direct appointments. The rest of them go through the Membership Mission and Review Board and this is one of those. But go on to the website and fill out, it's a generic application for any of the boards, but you can put in there which ones you're interested in. And then those go to a, a committee of people that fill those spots. And I just, you know, I know there's so many people that are passionate about this. So I encourage you to fill that out and leave that application in place because there'll be some movement. Even if the first set of people on there, what you want one of them, there's going to be movement. So keep that application in. Awesome. All righty. So um, let's run through uh, before we go on. Ernest, do we have any questions? No questions. Okay, great. Um, so let's go through the other, the second half of the BCC meetings. Um, OUC um, basically had an application for their um, power plant relay station near Split Oak. Right outside of Split Oak. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I don't know, do you know where Split Oak is? I don't know if you know anything about, she's the Split Oak lady. So. <laughs> so, I got to take a deep breath. <laughs> I, um, I will say that Whenever there's a wetland impact on our agenda, one of the things that you often see in the staff report is what is happening in, to mitigate that. And the applicant in a land use case can use, buy credits and use a mitigation bank, a wetland mitigation bank. And just a little history, back when the county decided to build the convention center, it purchased some mitigation land, and part of that was split up. Um, in addition to other conservation investments, including an investment between Orange County and Osceola County, and the Florida Conservation Trust, um, invested, has held 
this piece of property in conservation and has maintained and improved, which means that FWC has invested and other groups to make sure that the biodiversity there is, is rich. It's also an area of relocation for gopher tortoises who have been, whose burrows are in areas that are gonna be developed. It is a, um, a last remaining vestige in an area that is really being paved over. And so it has been a, a source of passion for uh, so many of us to try to make sure that nobody is tinkering with the conservation of that area. So um, this is not in Split Oak, this power plant small substation is not in Split Oak, but it's close. And so it gave me some cause for concern. And then I started looking through the report and there were it, immediately, what caught my attention was that it was considered, even though it was surface waters, a class one as far as its evaluation. Um, the reason why is because there were threatened species found on site and there was nesting by the threatened species, species found on site and a threatened species in Florida is Florida's designation for um, a, a species that may be at risk based on population and lost habitat. It doesn't get the same protections that animals on the endangered species get, list get, but it does give them a certain amount of protections. And one of those is the type of designation that was put on this piece of property for evaluation. Mm -hmm. And as per usual, there was only one no vote on the approval of the conservation area impact. So, and you know, sand skinks and, and um, sand hill cranes are some of the species that Florida is really known for, you know, and we're seeing these beautiful species. Yeah. And these were found on this piece of property. I think yeah. it's crazy that there's so many things that I didn't understand about the way that that public hearing went for this land use because usually if a commissioner asks a question they get an answer and i asked if in our code it requires an applicant to really show that there was no viable alternative yeah and so i asked i said you know if we're going off of code based you know this is why staff is approving is because on this in code it says that um you found that there was no viable alternative no reasonable viable alternative what was that? What was that process? What was looked at? And mm -hmm. I got no answer. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of other properties. I, I would assume OUC could have. Or even the layout on the property. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was some talk about being concerned about having to build up an area for the substation and what that would do for drainage. But that doesn't explain conservation area issues. That explains what the neighbors didn't want, which I also think is a concern. But we're looking at this actually application was for a conservation area yeah. permit. And I was the only one that asked this question. I was the only one that voted no. And I just, I wanna implore with you that if you've seen me at a, a climate event, if you know me from the environmental world, I need you. I mm -hmm. still need you. I understand that it feels somewhat comforting to have somebody sitting here that keeps an eye on these things, but it doesn't matter because I'm one vote. Yeah, And so public pressure has to be across the board when you sit on a board and it has to be regular frequent and diligent because this came up and went down like this and that's that it's now going to be a, a power station on the same day on the same day that we signed a proclamation saying that we would work with local utilities to make sure that we got down to net zero carbon emissions so just saying yeah, and you know, that's vital habitat that's just being chipped away all around Split Oak. It's it's really going to become a very urbanized area when animals are going to be displaced and they're going to run into roads. They're going to run into areas that are in people's backyards. And then, you know, we're going to have an outcry about seeing bears and birds and things in people's yards. And so it's just really sad, you know, because I, I really feel like we need to have a conversation. It needs to be said. And thank you for saying it because people need to speak up on behalf of our natural resources, our habitats, and our animals because our code currently does not reflect those. Oh, I, actually, I take, I, I, I think you're wrong. The code does. But the code, the code, much like the Constitution and the Bible, mm -hmm. can be picked for things that you want to support your case, that's right? True, and I, and I listen, I, I understand that those staff reports are not done in a vacuum, right? They're done, it's, there are lots of 
input from different people, different parties, different departments. But the reality of it is that if you are looking at this type of impact, because there is no other reasonable alternative, and the elected person in front of you asks, well, what were those alternatives? How was that, how was that evaluated? And there's no answer at all, then that should be a cause for alarm for everybody sitting there and anybody yeah. listening. And I just don't know if, I don't, I don't always understand the disconnect. And I, I threatened to call it all a big greenwash, you know, when we signed proclamations. Mm-hmm. We, do, we love a proclamation here. But if we don't live it in the vote, it doesn't matter. It yeah. just doesn't matter. So anyway, I'm sorry. I get a little... Absolutely. Not to mention that, you know, the fact that there's a wetland right there, you know, wetlands need to be protected. And it just feels as though every two weeks you're seeing wetlands being Well, that's really exactly right. So the impacts on this that were, there were two different specific. One was the, the you know, the class one surface water that was elevated because of the, the, the species found there. The other one was the class two wetland, which was sort of the surrounding area. And yes, she's exactly right. This came up um, again and again and again, that these wetlands, when we mitigate for those somewhere else, which is what happens in our mitigation, that the really the benefits to the community where that wetland sits, which are flood mitigation, which is water quality improvement, which is a stable ecosystem and, mm-hmm. and habitat, mm-hmm. they don't get that. So uh, look, I get it. The mitigation banking world is profitable. It is, you know, there's all kinds of, I don't know, invisible wetlands out there that people get to throw their money at when Mm. they decide to pave over something. But it does not help the people of District 1 and their water issues. And so that was the point that I tried to make, (laughs) which I don't know if it it translated, but the, the, when you look at an agenda that's got two applications for seawalls because water elevation is going up in, in lakes, this isn't the sea. It means that we're retaining more water from runoff and we're not doing the job that wetlands need to do, which is helping protect from flood and filtration. Mm-hmm. So it's quality and quantity of water. Yep, and this has happened in you know Houston. This is happening in other places where we could learn from the mistakes of other areas where we overpaved really essential like headwaters and wetlands that could have helped with flooding. And instead, we mitigated, 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 yeah. and then we, we caused residents to lose their homes. And the value of their homes. And I, I want to say something else that came up that I think is important, knowing that there was a proclamation signed, you know, looking at our um, our commitment to climate neutrality and climate change, trying to really do everything we can to not contribute to the ongoing, you know, march towards climate disaster. And the other, I just lost my train of thought. No, you're absolutely right. The proclamation is basically putting a stamp on our, as a county, our stance on climate change and that we are going to do everything we can. But Wetlands are a really great uh, carbon sequestration yes. tool that nature has already built in into yeah, our natural right. ecosystem. You know, and so preserving them is part of our energy efficiency proclamation. Well, and sustainability. So, you know, if you look at some of the areas, and I think this is sort of an interesting conversation for people who think, oh, we live inland. We don't have to worry about the rising seas. But climate change also affects the rate of our, our storms, our afternoon thunderstorms, if you didn't notice this in your own yard or coming mm-hmm. off your own roof, mm-hmm. the volume that comes down in an hour has changed. And yes. it's just, a, it's a, an effect of the ongoing, uh, really impacts of climate mm-hmm. globally. And so those more extremes, it all ends, right? Droughts are gonna be more extreme and, and wet times are gonna be more extreme. And so in Orange County, our formula for how we store stormwater has been the same since the beginning of time. I think they like have it written on a stone somewhere downtown down there. And so I have really tried also when, you know, when these things started coming up and I spoke with my friends in Gotha and I spoke with my friends in the Sand Lake area and they had really legitimate concerns about the way we're calculating storm runoff. And then I, I meet with the people that do that here and that formula is, like you would think it was really, you know, in the constitution. It's not in the constitution. It can be adjusted. It just is gonna require someone to actually admit that there needs to be an adjustment. And so I made that point also when we talked about the seawalls because of the, um, the 
I think the people who are applying for these seawalls have every right to try to protect the erosion in their lakefront property. Mm -hmm. But the bigger picture is that the reason why they're having to do that is because there's something fundamentally changing in our sea, in our lakes, and they're going up and up because we are we have more runoff, we have less wetland. Anyway, that's yeah. So thank you for being brave enough to talk about that yeah, thank because you. it's a huge. It's just fine. It's refreshing to hear somebody on the board kind of sound the alarm. Well, I wouldn't, uh, and I wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for for you all, like basically understanding the importance and talking to us about it, right? Because those impacts, when you talk to the people in Gotha and you talk to the people in Sand Lake and in Johns Lake, they describe it very well. I mean, there's a there's no question that they've sometimes these people have been there for generations. So we're not even talking about people who've lived here for five, seven years. We're talking about people who have really seen the impacts. And so, you know, the conversations having, our internal conversations with staff about, you know, the fluctuations in water levels, mm -hmm. I, I get to rely on you all because I have residents who have been here long enough to say, no, this isn't a five, 10 year thing. I'm telling you what's happened over the last 50 years. Yeah. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, the developers and our planners, we're, we're all gonna have to think in a new way because the climate is changing so rapidly that things that applied when our first, you know, our last comprehensive plan was put into fruition are changing. The storms are, you know, pouring down more water, they're lasting longer, we're having more threats it, to our communities, it, and so we need to be smarter, right. innovate. It, and some of those things don't even require, so I know there's, you know, I think it's very intimidating to take on the idea of some of those, you know, the mitigating options, because some of them look so complex, right? Carbon sequestration, blah, blah. But really, some of them are really basic. So we try to hold up as an example some of the LID or low impact development mm -hmm, options mm -hmm. for surfaces, parking lots, and how we're making those and where that water is going. Because there are now surfaces that absorb water differently than just purely letting it run off. And so looking at that as an op those options, looking at where and how we're planting, and this is another really big goal in this office, is we have all these required storm, storm water retention areas that are currently um, they're just poison pods, right? Because we're not doing anything that looks like nature yep. with with that. And so we are working really hard here with EPD and, and, and with some of our partners in the community and environmental experts on ways that we can make those operate the way that nature operates to filter and to hold water. Because we're gonna, we've taken enough now that if we don't figure out how to put some of that wetland back, we're gonna be in big trouble. And I think that we've got the opportunity in that these are Orange County owned ponds that we can figure out how to retrofit to mimic the wetland systems. We yeah. would be really providing a benefit for all residents. And that's what they do down in Reedy Creek. I mean, that's how they filter. And so, you know, we wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be groundbreaking. These are things that are being done. That's been done by nature naturally that we ruined. And then now we're trying to, you know, use in our common practice. Yes. Um, so let's do a speed round really quick. Um, so CPACE program for commercial areas, if you wanted yeah, to chat about that. You know, so acronyms again, and I don't even know what this one stands for, except for to say that it is a different kind of financing that would allow commercial ent entities. So this is not applicable for residential, um, residential lend, uh, I'm sorry, borrowers. This is purely for commercial entities. So businesses out there that want to make improvements that fall into sort of that sustainability um, category. Uh, a lot of times it's things like um, uh, upgrading their insulation or their compressor or making sure that their refrigerants are are not um, out of code, making sure that their insulation is the right way. So really bringing them up to what we want to see or what they want to see more often in sustainability. And also it brings a benefit to the business because a lot of times there are things that needed to um, happen as a cause just maintenance, right? Bringing an old building into a different era. Well, there, there are very limited ways that businesses can get loans to operate and, um, you know, do upgrades and make operational changes. And so the very traditional ones, of course, look like mortgages. And, you know, for those of us that have never done a business loan, it's a similar thing where your lenders, as you, if you are taking money from lenders, they get in line and 
your mortgage holder is usually your primary lender because it's usually the largest amount. And so small and medium sized business entities, commercial entities have a really hard time finding specific lending for this type of project. And what CPACE does is it's a commercial pro program, not funded by the county, but just overseen by the county and actually also by state statute that will provide a different form of lending for commercial entities for these projects. And it's based off of their, um, their property taxes as opposed to their business operations. So it doesn't yeah. have anything to do with their actual business operation side. It really goes into that property tax side. And if you have any interest in this program or you're curious about it, we have not passed it yet. This was the second discussion that we had about it. So there'll be another meeting that will come with a vote. And I think it's going to be a great opportunity. We've heard from areas that already have this in place where commercial entities and we've had, you know, grocery store owners show up and tell us, look, I don't know if I would be doing as well as I'm doing if it wasn't for this opportunity because I was able to upgrade and use a building that was going to be not usable. Um, so there, there's really some great examples out there. We in an abundance of caution because on the residential side in other areas, there had been some uh, predatory practices. The staff here, Jeff, and our amazing staff here jumped in to see really what the um, potential risks would be for the commercial side. And there really aren't examples that were identifiable as sort of a caution flag. Um, but one of the things that the county is contemplating is adding a consent line to the ordinance, which means that the primary lender, the mortgage holder, would have to consent to the additional financing for the CPACE uh, loan. Mm -hmm. And so right now that's in play. The idea is that um, if this business entity, commercial entity is somehow at risk and becomes insolvent, that the line of predators changes and the CPACE lender jumps the mortgage holder in line for payment. And so there's, you know, there's some folks out there who are looking at this that think it's a good idea to make sure that that lender gives consent. Well, the state statute actually requires um, there to be notice. So the primary lender is notice, notified by the CPACE lender of the application and process of, of funding. And the concern I had with the consent part of it was that if there is a primary lender who just doesn't even respond, doesn't send that consent, then that project could fail. And that could be the difference between a business being viable or not. And I, I, my concern is that the smaller projects, the smaller businesses and medium sized businesses in our community won't have the opportunity to take advantage of this type of financing. And there really just aren't as many opportunities for them to get financing in the first place. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. If you know anything about this and you have a thought about it, if you came from an area that had CPACE financing and you saw it in, in operation, please, please, please let us know. I want to hear what your thoughts are because we are not, we haven't voted yet. We will go to a vote in the next um, month. Maybe I think it's the end of the month, Yay. October. So exciting. Uh, real quick on updates for upcoming events. Uh, please go to NicoleWilson.org to sign up for the newsletter on the homepage and go to the event page, which we keep up to date on all these community meetings and planning, rezoning Busy. community meetings and just the virtual office hours too. And if um, we miss something, let us know because I know there's so many dates coming up. So we, many. we will share you know we love a community event we want to make sure that we're spreading the word shout out to angie and connor our two interns that are um helping us to keep everything going uh, and let me tell you something it is a lot so it's i'm lot so grateful stuff. for them and for you all and for you all most of all our bosses out there um we are yeah we are just making sure that we're trying to to get as much information out as possible i know it does seem overwhelming sometimes but sort through it for whatever you find interesting and you can always come back and uh, revisit any of the comments um, that have been made. And then also, if there's something you want to hear us talk about or you have a good idea for a guest speaker, we love bringing people in. So yeah. um, thank you for being here. Yes, so October 4th is the Waterley meeting um, for the residents around Waterley. Um, please come um, at the Waterley Clubhouse. And you can see that at NicoleWilson.org. Also, we have a community meeting for the LCN planned development on October 5th. Um, after 5, that's going to be 6.30. And then October 7th, Chris Castro is coming between 4 and 5 o'clock. 
uh, to come and sit on the couch. Yay. And who is Chris, Chris Castro? For those he, of you who don't know, the very famous to us, Chris Castro. He is the director of sustainability for the city of Orlando, and um, he also started the organization Ideas for Us, which is the climate advocacy group that I came from. And um, he's going to talk about some of the city of Orlando's sustainability plans that you know, I see Jeff Benavides has a lot of similar plans at the exactly. county level that he's starting, but um, Chris has been around a little bit longer, so he has some cool updates. To and share. I was going to say, and a key contact for us when you think about partnering with a municipality that really understands these challenges and how to try to make sure that we're implementing things that are going to make long-term differences. So we're really excited for that. Yeah. Any last words to the amazing constituents? I, you know what? I thank you so much. I wanted to clarify just really quickly about some of the, when you get a notification about a community meeting about a development that is from the planning department, because I know that one of those mm -hmm. overlaps with um, one of our redistricting meetings, which I was mm -hmm. like, wait, wait, but it was too late. The notice had gone out. And I just want you to know that when those those particular ones about an applicant who wants to make a land use change, those come from planning. We have we work with them on it, but it doesn't come from here. What we're trying to do is sort of kick it up a notch and make sure that even the people outside the area of mailings get as much information as mm -hmm. possible. So mm -hmm. if you know of something that either you know needs to be notified, something coming mm -hmm. up, or you see a conflict in dates like that, give us a heads up. We are doing the best we can to try to get that calendar thing, you know, as convenient as possible, but it's a challenge with as much going on as there is. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to email district1 at ocfl.net with any additional questions. And thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Happy Thursday.